Our citizenship is in heaven, Paul says to the church he started there in Philippi, in Macedonia. He was writing from what we believe was one of his earliest imprisonments in Ephesus on the coast of what is today Turkey. Now, if you looked up in your old Revised Standard Bibles in the pews there today, you would have read, our commonwealth is in heaven. The King James had an even odder translation, our conversation is in heaven. But most literally, the Greek word polituma in orenos might read, our political status is in heaven. Uranos, as in the planet Uranus, for heaven. Well, that's a powerful statement for a political prisoner to make. My political status is in heaven. What you may not know is that the apostle Paul actually had a very rare status for Jews in those days. He was not only, as he says here in the outset of the passage, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee. He was a Roman citizen as well. There's a passage in Acts chapter 22 in which a Roman tribune asks about Paul's nationality. And there's, there's where we learn that Paul was born a Roman citizen. It was a much coveted political status that the Tribune says he had to pay himself a large amount of money to obtain. And yet, we know that Paul's Roman citizenship was no get out of jail free card. Throughout his ministry, Paul was locked up repeatedly, even though his supporters had likely paid the jailers enough bribes to buy him the privilege he had of writing to all these various churches he had planted. And as we know, Paul eventually was executed by Caesar during his final imprisonment in Rome. So in many ways, when Paul became a Christian and a citizen of heaven, he became a refugee. He went on the run from those who were paid to enforce the laws of empire, as well as those from his own group, the Pharisees, who would strictly enforce the laws of God. So why would a man in such a comfortable position so joyfully renounce this kind of citizenship for another kind? Citizenship in heaven. Well, I would say he did it for love because Christ had set him free to a new life that was filling him with joy. And he was compelled by that love and that joy to spread the good news of this kingdom of heaven that Christ proclaimed, this kingdom of heaven that was not pie in the sky in the future for Paul. It was his living reality right then, right now. I know what joy looks like, the joy of freedom. I think Pastor Jen does too. She has children of that certain age, you know, toddlers. I remember when my daughter was a toddler, she loved nothing better than to going to our little neighborhood park, Totland, where they had the little fenced in area for kids and then there was the great wide open spaces for the big kids. Well, early in her development, she learned how to open the gate. She not only learned to open the gate, she learned to fling it wide for the other toddlers and to set them free into the green as their mothers would chase them. And they would run, you know, squealing with joy. But you know what they would always do? They would stop at some point and they would turn and look back to be sure that they were being chased. Well, According to one scholar who I read, David Fredrickson, who's pre professor of New Testament at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, he says that the English translation of this passage, when we read about Paul running the race that is set before him, it's a little misleading. I don't know about you, but in my Good News Bible, when I was a teenager, we had those little stick figure illustrations. And of this passage, they had like an Olympic runner, you know, and he was straining forward for the goal, which was the tape, the finish line. Well, what this 
uh, scholar said, this is where I love my Bible nerds, my friends, my buddies. He looked it up and he found that these words that are used for, um, in this passage, words like fugine to flee or diokine to pursue, these were the words that were most commonly used by ancient Greek romantic poets to illustrate the love for the, of a lover for the beloved or even for the, the hunter in the chase. It was all the same, you know. You remember those Greek vases that always would have the lovers chasing each other around the vase? This is the image that these words would have evoked. And what a perfect image for that goal that you can't quite ever attain. But what he says is, the maiden is always looking back over her shoulder, hoping that she is caught. This is where, where Paul would place Jesus Christ, the beloved, hoping that we will pursue. And this is where um, the green cards of grace come in that I had in my sermon title. Some of you will remember Lloyd Johnson, our first refugee, the first refugee that our church helped Iris resettle here in the United States. And we celebrated with him recently when he finally worked his way through the system and got his US citizenship after many years. It was an enormous milestone in his life on his refugee journey from West Africa. And it made it possible for him to bring his own beloved into this country, his new wife, La. Citizenship in our country is something all refugees and immigrants have to work very hard to earn unless you have the easy path, as we, many of us did, where you can be born into citizenship, as Paul was, or you can marry into citizenship. So for Paul, I could see in this passage a beginning of this theology he develops of the church as the beloved bride of Christ. The language of love and marriage works well as a metaphor for how we obtain our citizenship in heaven. You know, people who knew Saul, the old Paul, the one who crusaded against Christianity, must have been amazed at the change that transformed Paul. A man who once was so proud, no longer boasted of his credentials as a Jew or as a Roman citizen, but instead claimed heavenly citizenship in the love of Jesus Christ, which gave him enormous peace. It makes you wonder if the whole world could be transformed like that by the peace that the love of Christ can give us. It makes you wonder if the prayer of Jesus might actually one day come true, that God's will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, I believe that it can. I believe that as long as we are running toward Christ and toward that relationship and not away, that all things are possible. Because what would the world look like if we all lived as if we really were citizens of heaven now and not just in the future? What if we could step back a little bit from our proud identities and our families or in our uh, racial or ethnic heritage, our national heritage, our own pride as US citizens? What if we could look at ourselves on this World Communion Sunday from a God's eye view as brothers and sisters living this delicious dream of the psalmist, the stream of peace for the world. I think we would more eagerly be reaching out to one another to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and welcome the stranger. So if this is an appealing vision for you, I wanted you to know that thanks to my wonderful graphic designer husband, I have green cards of grace available at the doors for everyone in the little offering plates when you go out. I invite you to take one as you leave and share it with someone you know who may need to be set free by this amazing grace of Jesus Christ. 
because Jesus Loves Me is more than a sentimental song for children. It is truly the greatest love story ever told. A tale like a tale of two cities where the man dies, gives his life for his beloved. A tale like Casablanca where Rick sees Ilsa onto the plane. A tale even like Avatar today. But this love story is God's love song for us. Our beloved gave his life for us that we might have this incredible joy and freedom in new life. Thanks be to God for this good news. Amen.